Ming Lao, this week we invited uh, Professor Sean Tunnell, who is one of the key economic advisors to NLD government and then Dong Sun Suji. Uh, we're going to discuss the state of the economy and upcoming economic policy, which is going to be announced by the NLD government and Dong Sun Suji government. And there are expectations and a concern among the local businessmen. So we will start to open the discussion. Sean, welcome to the AR, Sean. And uh, I want to start to open this discussion with a question on the, the upcoming government policy, which is going to be announced, I believe, uh, at, at the end of this month. And it has been in power for three months, and uh, the report has been delayed, and uh, there is no clarity on economic policy. Indeed, people are concerned, and businessmen are frustrated, and investors are worried. And, and uh, there's a deep frustration share among businessmen who wanted to know what direction the country is going to go. And so I think uh, hopefully there will be, uh, will be uh, clarity on uh, economic policy uh, to clear the, the cloudy sky, I hope. Sean, can you elaborate and enlighten us on this subject? Yeah, well, I, I think clarity will emerge by the end of the month. Um, I think, in part, we're dealing with a problem of expectations here, right. uh, in that expectations, I think, for the new government were sky high. Um, and that's in great contrast, of course, to the previous government, to the Tansane government, where I think expectations were so low that almost anything that was done in a roughly reformed direction met the applause of you know, local business, international business and diplomats and so on. So I think partly this is, this is an issue of expectations. Um, having said that, they're completely understandable. You know, the, these expectations are understandable. There's a lot of hope, remains a lot of hope and expectation about the new government. Uh, so, you know, there, there has been a delay, I think it's fair to say. Um, but I think we need to sort of go into that to see why that might be the case. And my own feeling is that what we always have to remember is that the new government had no real idea of what the real situation was before they came into office. Really? So, yep. So even though there was a lengthy transition period, access to critical ministries, to data and so on, was often simply not there until they actually took office. So when we're talking about making you know, fundamental changes of direction in economic policy, or indeed even keeping in the same direction, you really need to know where you are. You know, before you go off somewhere else, you need to know where you are in the first place. So what's been happening these last few months is just to try and work out, well, what is the current situation? And this is in all sorts of practical uh, ways. Most principally, how much money is available? You know, the NLD has a very ambitious program for social inclusion. We know that the NLD wants to increase spending on health and education and build up the human capital uh, here in the country. But you need to know then what sort of financial resources have you got? What are the debts being taken on by the government? What's the true situation of state-owned enterprises, for instance? To what extent are they a drain on the budget? To what extent are their foreign exchange earnings being properly brought into the budget? And so all of that, trying to work all of that, has taken considerable time. So even though the delay, I think, is probably a little bit longer than people might have expected, mm -hmm. I think it's entirely plausible that that sort of length of time was necessary just to work out exactly where we were. So data hasn't been provided from the previous government. Are you saying that you are starting from this clean sheet, just a blank sheet, nothing has left? Partly it's a blank sheet. It, it, it's not completely blank, of course, and it depends on which ministry we're talking about or which state-owned enterprise we're talking about. So there is some data around and some of that data was shared, but there are significant gaps as well. And I should just say, in defence of the previous government, I think they didn't have the, 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 the information either. You know? So I think the whole issue of data, of course, has long been a problem. It's been a problem for 50 years. And so, but the new government coming in, of course, uh, comes into a situation where everything is new, uh, where perhaps the rules of thumb and simple procedures that, that might have been available to the previous government just wasn't available to the new one. And they, you know, there's all sorts of new people they need to interact with, mm -hmm. departmental systems, procedures and all of that. So to get on top of all of that and just to find out where the situation really was has taken a little bit of time. And, and you know, again, I think that's a, it's a, the, the delay is a plausible one uh, in, in the context of, of what they were up against, basically. Well, thanks, John. Uh, uh, people are very anxious. 
uh, businessmen are very anxious to, to learn and to know more about. And uh, meanwhile, the construction projects in Forest and Yangon has been suspended and a review. A lot of projects in other, other parts of Burma are also being under review, mm. uh, which were approved by the uh, previous regime. And that is also a concern. Mm. On this issue, there's a real dilemma, isn't there? Because uh, if projects have been approved and they're going ahead, normally you would want to see them go ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think the default position of the new government will be to deliver that, that sort of certainty. In other words, not to act in a retrospective way. However, there has to be some exceptions to that over issues to do with safety, for instance. So for argument's sake, if a building is being built and it is in fact in breach of a whole host of ordinances, maybe safety procedures, maybe some other issues that are really damaging socially and economically perhaps to other people, then you know you need to have a look at that and possibly change it if, if that's the problem. So, um, so it, it's an interesting dilemma that one. As I say, normally you would want to see uh, a lack of retrospectivity in a sense, like you, you don't want to change the rules after the event and after something is underway. But Again, if, for example, you find that a building doesn't meet structural requirements, safety aspects and so on, then you probably want to revisit that. But not only that, but also we're place. talking about the other projects in Shansta due to the environmental concern. Yeah. And, and these projects have been stopped and suspended. Yeah, indeed. I mean, in a sense, the same response to those as with projects, you know, great big tall buildings in Yangon. Um, and that is that normally the default position is that projects that have been approved, you would want to go ahead. But if you find that, you know, a, a sober cost benefit analysis was such that the environmental destruction was such that the project really shouldn't go ahead, or if there were human rights issues, if people were losing land. In other words, again, if, if the cost of this project was, uh, was greater than the benefits, if the, you know, the effects of the projects were detrimental to the country as a whole, then I think it's a reasonable thing to revisit those projects. Uh, because, you know, in one sense, uh, the transition was different than, say, a normal transition in, in most countries that, that go from, say, Democrats to Republicans or Labor to Conservative or whatever. Here we've had a qualitative change in government and a new government committed to certain things with respect to human rights and environmental issues and so on. So I think business would have, uh, I think any sort of prudent business would expect that the standards uh, might be different. And so um, uh, if there are more delays because of that, then you know, it seems to me that that, that is something that, that really would and should have been factored in, I think, by investors in projects that were that brought with them great environmental damage or human rights issues. So I heard a rumor that there has been a communication problem within the uh, NLD government uh, to announce uh, to announce the uh, economic policy, and also I suspect everyone is waiting for the ladies' approval. Is it right? Well, I think on the communication issue, I, I mean, it's probably fair to say that the communication issue. Um, uh, you know, has been a, a little bit of a problem, but I think that problem is actually the flip side of a virtue as well, which is that the government, you know, doesn't put a lot of emphasis on what we would call in the West sort of spin or the, the PR, if you like, mm -hmm. in favour of actually just getting the work done. So my perception on this is that, you know, the people who would be probably best placed to do the messaging are also the people who are actually writing the policy, finding out where the money is and all those other issues that I mentioned earlier. So, um, you know, at, at a moment where there's a huge amount of work to be done, a very limited pool of people who are able to do it, um, I think that that may be one of the reasons why perhaps there's been less emphasis on the messaging. Um, I think probably, you know, if we had the time over again, uh, then messaging might have got a bit of a, a higher priority than it, uh, than it has up until now. Messaging is needed. I think people want to have a, a constant messaging, like in the West. You know, people want to know what direction they are going. And I want to jump into the um, the other areas of uh, foreign investment and foreign investor. What can they expect from from this uh, economic policy? Well, I think overall much greater stability. Um, foreign investors look for lots of things. I mean, they, they look for profitable opportunities, and I think this yeah. country has that in abundance. So that, that, that's number one. This is a good place to come. You know, we're in a world at the moment where yields are incredibly low, and the expression that's often used in financial markets in the West and other places is the desperate search for yield. 
Now, this is a country with lots of yield, and so uh, I think foreign investors are interested. But foreign investors, after they've decided that you know this is a reasonably profitable place to invest in, then look for stability. They look for certainty. They look for security. And I think that's exactly what this government will deliver. Um, over time, one could imagine the great political issues of this country, uh, some of the conflict, etc., will begin to lessen because of the, of the very fact that it's a democracy and uh, disputes, etc., are resolved in different ways than they might have had in the past, will give much greater certainty and security to foreign investors. Likewise, and again, even though you know perhaps the detail of a lot of policy hasn't come out yet, I think that the overall promise of a government that is that is uh, broadly favourable to business, uh, that will secure property rights, that's not going to go off in outlandish directions. They're, they're not going to suddenly, for instance, change the currency to base nine or anything like that. When we're, we're gonna, not going to see that stuff that we've seen in the past. So for all of those reasons, I think that foreign investors, A, can identify profitable opportunities. And this country is emerging as the go-to place for a lot of people, from tourists to uh, manufacturers and so on. But coupled with that very deep layer of stability, which really was not here before, I think will send assurances to foreign investors. Um, I, I think, as with policy, you know, we were talking about delays in policy, I think um, we, we see exactly the same thing on the foreign investor side, which is the mirror, if you like, which is that foreign investors too uh, were preparing for the change of government. So we saw a lot of foreign investment begin to dry up towards the end of the Tensane government. Then as the new government's come in, these foreign investors are now looking at the situation anew and getting ready to come in. And I think that's very much the case with a lot of Western firms who face consumer issues, reputational brand breeding problems, etc. if they rush in too quickly. So I think we can expect uh, quite a bit of foreign investment, but again, particularly from the West, uh, yeah. comparably. Yeah, sure. But in, 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 your, in, your, in your comment, you also mentioned about the conflict, and because now the, the new government and all the uh, priority issue is uh, to build and to restore peace and stability in this country. And in this country, we have seen that uh, civil war going on for the last decades. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, the investor would be worried, particularly from foreign countries. Um, some, are, some may not, but most of them will be worried about investing in uh, conflict zones in these areas, right? I think that's absolutely right. And this is why I think sometimes the criticism about the delays in economic policy miss the fact that ending the conflict is a very significant economic policy because this is, as you say, this is a very significant impediment mm -hmm. uh, to foreign investment. You know, there, there's nothing that foreign investors like less than, than conflict. Um, so to the extent that we can get some sort of long-term solution to that, that will be one of the foundations upon which you can build good economic policy. Sean, uh, I also would like to ask you about the, uh, you know, the, the McKinsey report uh, that was put out in 2000, 2013. And uh, it, it, it clearly mentioned the unique opportunities that we have. Uh, Burma has been sitting between the two giant uh, neighbors, China and uh, India, and, and a huge potential market. If we realize ourselves the potentials and these opportunities, Burma or Myanmar's economies will become one of the success stories yeah. in these 10 or 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, but also that report also mentioned that not just solely rely on the, 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 the energy and uh, mining sectors, not just on the agriculture sector, to expand the uh, economies, uh, the size of the economy to expand but also you need to create the skills and talents and you have to have a visionary leadership mm -hmm. where you want to move from A to you know, B, you know, yeah. and then you have to have a leadership with a vision. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that's very important. Can you, can you talk about the unique opportunities that we have as well as challenges like infrastructure issues mm -hmm. and uh, you know, communication issues? Burma is also becoming one of the first growing mobile, you know, based countries yep. in Southeast Asia. So. Yep. Yeah, the, the McKinsey report, I think, was an interesting one. Um, when it first came out in 2013, I think people looked at it and thought that this was only aspirational, a dream, in other words, not, not right. plausible that, that the country could ever get there. But if you look at it now, and the percentage growth rates required 
to get the sort of multiplication of GDP that, that the McKinsey report spoke of, uh, it's entirely reasonable. Um, I think even under worst case scenarios of not much policy reform, my own feeling is that uh, Burma will grow about 4% a year anyway. Uh, but, you know, do proper reform, and we're talking about growth rates 8 9% per annum. But what's McKinsey making a prediction on that? I indeed, and and it's, uh, you know, McKinsey just didn't pluck those figures out of thin air. You know, th they looked at what had happened in the region. They looked at what had happened with the so-called tiger economies and China, and these were reasonable numbers if you did the right sort of reform and put the other things in place, like you mentioned, infrastructure, electricity, and all the rest of it. So you get all that right, and those numbers look, it seems to me, entirely plausible. Now, one of the main reasons for that is the issue that you mentioned earlier, is that the location. I mean, at one level, you couldn't pick a better location. No. You know, if somebody said right now, if you're a country and you wanted to grow and so on, where would you like to be? Well, you'd like to be here, uh, which is right in the middle, as you say, between these two giants, the dragon and the elephant. Uh, and Burma is perfectly placed for both those countries in, in numerous areas. Um, so far, and under previous governments, it hasn't been necessarily a good story because really Burma has just been a quarry or a place to get cheap energy, sometimes a place to dump cheap consumer goods, uh, a range of things, in other words, that are not so positive. Mm -hmm. But that story can be completely turned around. Um, if we were to take up agriculture, for instance, and, and I agree that uh, ultimately uh, Burma's economic transformation will require a substantial move out of agriculture and into industry, but agriculture itself likewise though has much room to grow and much room to make people's lives better. Um, now the, the reason I say that is because we know that both of those countries, China and India, have got awful problems in food security at the moment. Not that people are starving, but that they lack access to good quality food. Credible controversy in China, for instance, over food quality. Additives, fertilizers, all sorts of things that are done on the cheap and done in ways that you know, are not conducive to health, etc. In India, you've got similar sort of situations with pollution and so on, but you've also got a lack of land and lack of water. Now here's Burma. It's sitting there with agricultural lands that at the moment are way below productive capacity. Hardly any fertiliser is used, there's been very little improvement, even green revolution stuff, which was a couple of decades ago, a lot of that hasn't been applied here. So from the productive base that's there at the moment can be fairly dramatic expansion. You get the right inputs to farmers, get them credit, start to develop rural roads and ports and milling facilities and storage capacity and so on. And the growth potential, I think, of uh, agriculture here is exponential. Plus then we get the branding, and I think this is something really important for Burma to, to grapple with right now. Develop a reputation for being a place of quality food. And you'll find ready markets then, not only in China and India, but even out, out beyond that as well. Likewise, None of that is theoretical. You know, if we look at countries like Vietnam and some of the others that have had significant improvements in the agriculture sector. Vietnam is becoming one of the top coffee exporters. Exactly. So the Vietnam strategy, which is not perfect, by the way, I think uh, Myanmar, Burma can do much better than, than Vietnam. But part of that strategy of Vietnam was to, uh, to identify certain niches and to really go after them. Uh, up until now, really, the strategy here in Burma has been on rice and paddy. And that's sort of understandable, right? Because right. people need that to survive. But paddy is not particularly profitable. But there can be great improvements there, so I don't want to underplay that. There can be dramatic increase in yields in, in paddy as well. But likewise, there's a lot of land at the moment that is being used for paddy that could be more profitably used in fruits and vegetables and other commodities which have much higher value adding. What about the tourism? Burma is one of the most beautiful countries in Southeast Asia and, and uh, completely uninspired a lot of areas in this country. And uh, do you think this government has a vision? I, I sure do. Tourism is one of the really big things. Um, tourism has a number of virtues. Um, firstly, it's about presenting your country to the world. Burma's got a great story. Uh, people are in love with the story. They're in love with the historical story. They're in love with the ancient monuments. They're in love with the old colonial buildings. They're in love even with the way that the, in a sense, the politics has, has arrived. Diversity, in a much place. And ethnicity, so. uh, diversity, 
all of that. Then the, the natural beauty, the unspoiled beaches and so on that, that you mentioned as well. Um, so tourism is, is one of those things that, that will certainly attract a lot of foreign investment, a lot of foreign visitors and so on. It has other virtues as well though, and that is tourism is a great employer. A lot of modern industries don't employ a lot of people because they employ a lot of capital goods, a lot of digital equipment and all the rest of it. Now tourism does that too, but it also has that human touch. That's what people want. They want that interaction. And so for those reasons, tourism tends to employ a lot of people. The jobs are also relatively good. Uh, they're, they're jobs that people come into contact with others uh, from the rest of the world. They start to broaden their horizons, just as the tourists do as well. Uh, it's an extraordinary supplier, of course, of foreign exchange. So you've, you've got a ready-made export industry, and that foreign exchange, as it comes into the country, then becomes the capital for further development into other industries as well. So tourism is one of those areas where it's uh, hard to identify any negatives, uh, but when I say hard, there are some, as we know. And so I think when we come to the current government and its policy in a, on uh, tourism, I think what we'll see is a focus upon quality tourism, good resorts, etc., uh, attract the people who are interested in the country's history, who are interested in the culture and all the rest of it. The thing to avoid, and I think the current uh, the government is anxious on this point, is to avoid... Um, well, uh, you might as well say frankly what it is, the, the sex tourism, etc., that has been such a problem. You're talking about Burma's neighbouring countries. For example. In the neighbouring uh, countries, exactly. So I think the, the, the challenge... Cambodia. Yeah, the, the real challenge exactly is, Cam is the Cambodia story, where, which has gone wrong in all sorts of ways. Um, so to avoid that, but other than that, uh, but that doesn't discount that as a problem, uh, but other than that, tourism is one of those stories that I think uh, is immensely positive. Sean, when we were talking about the country's economies and, and uh, foreign investment, uh, we still have uh, the, the sanction uh, imposed by the U.S. Burma is now one of the freest countries in, in Southeast Asia, and, and in terms of democracy, I mean comparatively. And if, if sanction is continued to impose because of some emotional issues uh, uh, involved in uh, Burma sanctions by the U.S. And also, is that some are values driven because of the past and the presence of from 1988 to up to now, and also I think uh, the legacy issues, uh, opposition in, in, in the past and the, the figureheads, they all wanted the sanction to be remain to, to force the regime to change. Do you think sanctions are still needed in this country? Well, I think you highlighted exactly what the issue is: that sanctions are a legacy right, of, of the past rather than the present. If we would look at the situation right now, it's extremely unlikely that sanctions would be newly imposed. Because uh, as you point out, in, in relative terms, this is a, a freer, uh, even more peaceful country than many of the, the neighboring countries yeah. are now. So for all those reasons, I think it's absolutely right to say that you know, what sanctions are really is a, a legacy issue. Um, to the extent that they're a problem, I think is an interesting one. Partly it's a, it's a reputational issue, it's a problem of a lack of clarity. And so, for instance, one of the biggest issues, say if you're a US company, you're looking at uh, Burma, you want to invest here, you'll be worried about whether you can get access to capital, whether you can access to credit, because the banks are often, uh, particularly since the global financial crisis, since the rise of terrorism and so on, uh, banks are very wary these days of getting uh, caught up in issues to do with money laundering, terrorist financing, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it means that banks are often very cautious about a country, particularly if there's any sanctions in place. So what, what I think needs to happen on the sanctions issue is that they need to be narrowed right down to become very clear that perhaps they're, they're level levied against certain individuals who might be a problem dating back to the past and maybe still to the present. But narrow it down to that, be very clear that that's all who is involved. And I think from that point on, people will then have much greater confidence uh, about uh, coming into the country and not being worried about caught, being caught up in the sanctions. So it is a legacy issue. I think it can be managed. It's one of those things that, um, as I say, you, you probably wouldn't have seen the sanctions levied now, uh, but it is, I, I think, a manageable, manageable solution. 
It is a difficult one though, because uh, because it's a legacy issue, it means that a lot of people have uh, a lot at stake on this issue. And as you mentioned, emotions are often part of this as well, uh, values and so on. And so it's going to be difficult, I think, to see them being lifted completely. But when you talk so, about narcotics and the drugs issue, one of the richest men people are sitting here, the own the companies here, uh, they are now uh, are in bed with their previous government as well as colluding with their, their uh, current government. And, uh, but they are also enlightened uh, cronies who want to integrate, uh, who felt humiliated. Uh, they, 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 they wanted to integrate, uh, they want to help the country, and they want to help the people. Uh, maybe they are a few, uh, um, but what about them? Well, yeah. It's a really good question because um, it gets to the issue really of principles and pragmatism. Right. You know, so, so we live in a world that on the one hand could be uh, deal in moral absolutes. You know, that there's black and white people uh, in terms of morally. <laughs> um, and uh, um, so it becomes an issue then of, uh, in the real world, we have to be more pragmatic about things like that. And so, uh, and you're absolutely right, of course, some of the people who uh, we identify as the cronies, some of them remain cronies. I mean, where really there's no other label that, that could uh, apply to them um, that remain, you know, questionable in all sorts of areas. But there are others who do very much have the national interest at stake. And so it's a matter of how do you bring them in? How do you bring them into the economy such that they benefit the vast number of people? In other words, how do you turn them into the sort of nation builders of the sort that the America had, for instance, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's and so on? Right. The sort of individuals who you really wouldn't want to look at too closely their business yeah, records, goodness. indeed. And yet they were able to be turned into uh, people who, in a sense, were able to bestow virtues on the country, uh, whether it be in the form of public libraries or uh, funds for national parks or whatever. So it becomes, I think, at some point a, a pragmatic issue, but while not giving up completely on principle, I think is really important. Um, but, uh, but a pragmatic look at, uh, at individuals who can be brought in uh, from the cold, if you like, and become the business people that the country needs and their capital, the capital that the country needs. And my last question, stolen revenues. And I think we had uh, learned about vast amount of money, some probably billions of dollars uh, from the gas and, uh, and the wine industries. Uh, if uh, exploitation of the revenue, exploitation of the uh, natural resources. And, I, and also, uh, I think, in five or seven years ago, you have written about uh, where the billions of dollars has been hiding, and uh, it's still mysteries where it has been located. Uh, uh, there is no public accounting. The Burmese people have no idea if the billions of dollars are still missing. It is our money. It's the country's money. Uh, so can you enlighten a bit on that? Sure, yeah. I mean, one of the, the most significant problems of the past in the economy was the disappearance of vast amounts of foreign exchange revenues, essentially from state-owned enterprises. Um, and I think we're now all familiar with the story of how the old exchange rate regime, when there was an official rate and then an unofficial rate, and one was exploited against the other, in a sense, to hide those revenues and to keep them offshore. And that was a significant issue. It was, a, firstly, an extraordinary vehicle for corruption. Uh, but also, of course, it meant that the country was starved from the resources, the financial resources that, that belonged to the people of, of Burma. I mean, it was the natural resources of this country. They're part of the wealth bestowed by nature on the country, and, and these were essentially expropriated. They could have been used for nation building. So that is a significant issue. And it gets back to the, uh, to the issue that I mentioned right at the very beginning about when the new government came in, it had to spend some time in just finding out where things were. What are the uh, accounts? What is the state of various state-owned enterprises? So I think what's going to be really important, and what I'm very confident is going to happen in the future, is that the new government will be take a much closer look at those revenues. And so those revenues do actually do come into the country and can be used in socially productive ways. You know, because again, as you Health mentioned, that's right. I mean, the funds here are really, the funds are really big. We know that the country desperately needs more spending on health, 
education, the, the creator of human capital, which is the most important capital of all, uh, and infrastructure. We, we only have to glance around to see that the, the lack of infrastructure. The funds that we're talking about are significant in terms of funding all of those things. And so that's where I think there will very much be a focus of the, of the current government about getting that right. But in order to do that, you've got to plan the, uh, the field uh, quite re responsibly, um, and you, you have to do a lot of investigation. You've got to find out what, what's going on. And so, uh, again, part of the reason, I think, for the, what people perceive, I think, as a fairly slow start, is just to try and work out, well, okay, where are we? And once we've established that, then the new government presumably will then be able to move off into the future direction that it wants. Thank you, Sean. But you haven't answered my question yet on uh, where the money we're hiding. Where the money is hiding in Singapore banks or in, in, in China or Thailand or where? Well, it's an interesting question, and one can't be a hundred percent sure because the people who, of course, took the money, never wanted to advertise the fact where it went. <laughs> so, um, so it's always going to be difficult to do that. Um, what we can say is that in countries like Singapore, for instance, there was a significant tightening up of the rules in the, well, five to six years ago. And so to the extent that any funds were there, uh, probably went to other places. Um, if one was to sort of think about where they could go, then some of the big financial centres in the Middle East were very clearly, uh, I think, the sort of destinations mm -hmm. for this sort of money. Um, with various political developments around the world, we suspect that some of the money dispersed away from there as well. It was broken up into smaller mm. bits and placed in different parts around both this region and also the Middle East and other places as well. Sure, thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much.